This is We've Got Issues on IPR News Radio, a weekly look at the political state we live in. Good morning. I'm David Castleman. Advocates for a new Sioux lock have been trying to get Congress to fund the project for decades. They say it's a matter of national and economic security to build a new lock to handle thousand foot iron boats. Congress first authorized the project in the 1980s, but has not come up with the money to pay for it. With President Trump in office, there's renewed optimism among some that now could finally be the time to build it. But my guest this morning argues that it should not be taxpayers footing the bill on the estimated $600 million lock. Jarrett Dieterle is a fellow at the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C., formerly worked at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Michigan. Jarrett, thanks for making time. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm uh, glad to be here. You co-wrote a, a piece for Michigan Capital Confidential last year on this uh, on this topic. That's a publication uh, of the Mackinac Center. How do you think the new lock should be paid for? Well, that's a good question. It's it's uh, quite literally uh, the million multi-million dollar question, I guess. Um, uh, obviously, the the Michigan congressional delegation and a lot of uh, of observers have been calling for the federal government uh, to step in and fund the lock. And so uh, me and my uh, colleague, Bill Newman, decided to uh, advocate a different model of financing uh, for the lock. And what we suggested was either a, a privatization model or um, a user fee model that would be run by the government uh, that would essentially unlock immediate funding for the lock and would allow uh, the lock to actually um, get funds that weren't federal but uh, be able to do its repairs and its maintenance that it needed. And uh, in exchange, uh, there would be user fees that would be uh, charged uh, to the ships that traverse through the lock, um, which would allow the uh, private entity uh, that potentially was funding the lock to recoup their investment. So it would be an alternate financing model to kind of clear up the log jam. Is there any place in the world where a, a lock is owned by a, a private company? So actually, the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been experimenting with uh, some uh, uh, public-private partnership models um, in which they've actually uh, uh, working with private entities that uh, operate and maintain uh, certain water infrastructure assets. And then uh, in exchange, as, as we said, there's usually some kind of a user fee or uh, a funding mechanism that's attached to that. And, of course, you see it on a much larger scale everywhere with other infrastructure assets, uh, most commonly toll roads is what we're used to. Uh, where you know cars will go and pay tolls, and, and that money goes to keep up the maintenance of the infrastructure. So it's not a totally uh, foreign idea that's uh, that's out of left field. Do you think that privatization is uh, politically viable at this point? I guess it's it's hard to imagine the federal government giving up an asset like the Zulox. That's a great question, and that's probably the most common uh, pushback uh, to our idea. Um, people kind of are leery of the idea of, of a private entity uh, owning. Uh, a lot, but but although I don't necessarily uh, agree that, that that's problematic, it's important to keep in mind that you know the private entity wouldn't necessarily have to own the asset. They could you know do a long-term lease or uh, some kind of contractual arrangement like a public-private partnership, as I mentioned, with the government. And uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, it, they wouldn't even have to have a private entity involved at all. You could actually just have Congress authorize the Army Corps of Engineers themselves who now operate and maintain the locks, they could be the ones that charge user fees for the boats to go through and raise money that way. Let's talk about that option, uh, where the Army Corps charges a fee uh, on ships as they pass through. Are, are they not doing that right now? Yeah, so uh, right now, um, no. And there, there is, of course, uh, certain uh, uh, taxes that are charged on different uh, kind of water vehicles um, around the country, um, mostly uh, on uh, like the Inland Waterways Trust Fund, which pays for, or at least a portion of that is supposed to go towards paying for some of the locks and dams and water infrastructure we have. But there's no actual user fee model, which is kind of a, a what some people will, economists will call a beneficiary pays idea, where if you're the one benefiting most from a certain asset and a certain structure, then it's not unreasonable to expect you to be the one that pays for that. And we see that all the time um, in government, of course, uh, sewers, electrical uh, uh, utilities, things like that. I mean, the actual end users, the people that are benefiting from those things, are paying for them in the form of some kind of a fee structure. Uh, it's not an idea that hasn't been used in other uh, forms of uh, public utilities and of public assets. Representatives of the shipping companies say that they're already uh, paying fees for infrastructure, and they point to the money that goes to the 
uh, what's called the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Uh, they pay a, a percent based on the, the value of the cargo delivered to a port. Um, and, and they say that, you know, the federal government is, is just not spending all that money on water infrastructure. What do you make of that argument? Well, you know, certainly there's uh, a lot of uh, good critiques of how the federal government uh, spends its money. Um, and uh, it's just important to, to keep in mind, though, that the federal government also has a lot of things that demand its money, uh, even with wa uh, water infrastructure. I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers itself has to operate and maintain almost 200 locks throughout the country. And I think they've estimated it would be $13 billion to get all those uh, up to speed and fixed again, because a lot of them were built in the 30s and are old. So um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's uh, critiques that can be made about where you know that money is going and, and what's being prioritized. But that's kind of one of our arguments, is that you know instead of uh, waiting for the Sioux Lock to be the thing that's prioritized and it gets the federal funding, um, which may never happen, that hasn't happened for 30 years, so it, it's not uh, clear that that's something that's going to be prioritized today or tomorrow or even into the future. So why not try some other mechanism that can get immediate funding uh, to uh, fix the, the uh, deteriorating Pell lock? You wrote that the, the prospects for a new lock were grim a year ago. And do you think that the odds have changed though since President Trump was elected? So it's certainly possible that they have. He and his campaign, of course, prioritized and spoke often about uh, infrastructure spending. And, um, you know, it may be more likely today that Congress uh, ends up appropriating the money that's needed. But I think even in the event it does, I still think that looking at alternate models like privatization and user fees is smart because it, it, we need to ask yourself, are we going to always be trying to fund things like Sioux Lock upgrades or new Sioux Lock um, and other water infrastructure, regular infrastructure, are we always going to be do it, doing it on this ad hoc basis of just expecting Congress to eventually step in with federal money? And it doesn't seem like a particularly sustainable model uh, down the long term. Jarrett Dieterle is a fellow at the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C. Jarrett, thanks for coming on.